This is Twit. Speaking of what's not nice, flying dirt boxes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even so, the name should tell you something. You have boy. a nice little graph or a graphic here. Yeah, the front page. I always try to put something relevant to the podcast topics on the first page, the bottom half of the first page of the show notes. Um, and this is from the, this is the graphic. I don't know. Maybe it was the Wall Street Journal. They broke the story, yeah. but they're behind a paywall that I couldn't get past. So everyone was looking at CNN's coverage of of this from the Wall Street Journal uh, uh, behind the paywall. Uh, but every, it, it got picked up and widely covered because it upset people. The story, okay, we've talked in the last few months about the so-called the, the so fake cell towers. And it's, we really need like cell, we need a better term than cell tower because there's nothing that's a tower about it, as I explained before. The idea it is... Looks more like a palm tree in some cases. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and it, well, what it really is is a briefcase. Um, in this you know, case. So, well, they've had this, what was it, the Stinger? Yes. Yeah. And that was my point is we talked about those. Uh, for example, in, uh, in, in maybe in Las Vegas, in casinos, where, or, or, or law enforcement. We know of, of, of municipalities all over the country that have these devices, which are essentially, they are, they're fake cell Systems, sites, you know, sites, uh, you know, sites. Uh, unfortunately, cell tower is really the only term we have. But, but, but I remember when you and I were talking about this before. You know, the question was, you know, could you, ha if you traveled, could a, could one of these hand off to a real cell tower? And it was no, because the way real cell towers hand off among each other is they're able to just switch the conversation from their feed to the, to, to the other tower's feed and make a seamless transition. In fact, that was really the, when, when we use the words, we're, when we use the term cellular, cell, that's what cellular means, is this really cool concept of a grid of, and it's actually a hexagon, ideally, of overlapping cells where each cell only has a short range and only needs to transact conversations within its radius. And then as a someone driving, in the classic example, drives out of that cell's coverage range, they're already in an adjoining cell's coverage. And by and by looking at the relative signal strength, the the, the outgoing cell can see that it's it's beginning to lose lose this guy and 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 it's so it's so it's able to query the adjacent cells and say hey who sees this guy and one of the cell towers says hey i do and then so the the other cell tower says okay you take over and so that switch occurs without the user without without anyone in the conversation ever knowing that's cellular communications and so you're able to drive from you know san francisco to san diego potentially i mean it doesn't really work but <laughs> You know, I, I had no idea that that's how it worked. I thought somehow the phone was involved, like, oh, I see a better tower. So it's actually the, the, the towers that are communicating with one another and doing the handoff themselves. And, and how negotiating. Interesting. Yeah, and negotiating that traffic. And so they, and they get all kinds of interesting uh, information. For example, um, I don't know if we talked about it on this show. There was some guy who was driving somewhere in the Midwest – on his commute with a very powerful cell jammer, uh, thinking he was doing some civic good by preventing other motorists in his environment from having any conversations on their cell phones because you're dick. not supposed to talk. Uh, I know. <laughs> and he was. That's horrible. He was, it was horrible. And it, it went on for like several years. And he was like blocking all emergency services and other stuff because it was just some horribly overpowered just blanket of the like the cone of silence driving down the freeway. Well, this the cell carriers all noticed this pattern that repeated at commute time, the same location, the same place every time each day during the week, not on the weekends, and they caught him because they were able to associate this 
this moving zone of destruction through the cell system um, and, and finally figured out, okay, that guy passes by the same time. Oh, there it is. For two yep. years. <laughs> this is the definition of dick behavior, ladies and gentlemen. Holy cow. He's going to face a $48,000 fine, by the way. Yeah, a ton of fines because yeah. it is is absolutely illegal to do this, and so the the, the point is that they the there there's monitoring of all this going on, and the cellular system gets feedback, and so what they saw was like this weird dead zone traveling down the geographical ter territory that was you know the freeway. <laughs> And finally put two and two together. Here's the story from The Verge. I'm loving this. By the way, it wasn't Verizon, AT&T, or Sprint that caught him. It was Metro PCS. Apparently, Verizon doesn't care. No. <laughs> they, ah, we, we see cells drop all the time. We got uh, your Reception money. was flatlining along the same point of I-4 in Florida twice each day. The FCC used, quote, sophisticated interference detection techniques. I've mm. seen the trucks. They, they're only... There's five or six of them. They're not a huge number, but they have these great trucks that can go out. Really cool Yagi yeah, antennas. Yeah, things. and track yeah. the stuff down. And um, officers, it was they found this guy in his Toyota Highlander. When officers finally pulled him over, it didn't take long to confirm their suspicions. As they approached his car, officers immediately noticed their radios lost all contact with dispatch. <laughs> Jammers, the FCC says, are illegal under any circumstances and can result in jail time. Yep. Wow. Yep. So that was, you know, um, we were talking about fixed um, or, or you know, law enforcement-based sort of suitcase things and, and how they use these, um, you know, when people don't know they're there. Basically, these things are pretending to be cell towers. They get your phone to connect to them uh, for whatever law enforcement purposes they are alleging. What the Wall Street Journal fat discovered and has been picked up is that there are also small aircraft flying overhead with the same technology um, called, I mean, the, the, in, in, in the articles covering this, there's, it's, it's like fake airborne cell towers in quote, D dragnet and inspect all phones below. So you can imagine the American civil liberties union, uh, is oh, yeah. unhappy. Chris, Chris Segoyan, who's their CTO, Sal Segoyan's brothers said this is appalling he says i can't imagine even if it that if a judge approved this he even understood the the incredibly widespread nature i mean you're gathering as many as hundreds of thousands of phones in this yes. dragnet yes you are you are causing every cell phone within its range on the ground to preferentially connect to this fake flying cell tower and you know, law enforcement says that they're they're doing it uh, to catch bad guys. How is this different from the guy in Florida? Because aren't they breaking the cell phone when they do this? It's a very good question. Whether you what what wh whether you know, can you hear me now? Can no, you hear me? Oh, it's sorry, a jammer. I'm sorry. I'm talking to a dirt box. <laughs> there's a government dirt box flying overhead. Yeah. Nineteen airports in the United States. These are Cessnas. They're small planes, and it, they say it covers. 90% of the U.S. population is covered by these flights. Wow. They say they gather, what I, What would they get? They would get the unique identifier for each phone. Yeah, they, you know, g generically we would say they get the metadata, uh, which is uh, they, they say they're not messing with the conversation. We know that the, we know that the boxes we were discussing before are I mean they're pretending to be cell towers. The decryption. There's no occurs. phone calls going through them though, right? I mean, it's not. <laughs> we as we've said before with these stingers, you're not going to continue to have operation. No, but you are. But but they are monitoring the conversations of the cell phones that they're intercepting. You will get five bars briefly. That. They <laughs> <laughs> Look over your head if you're getting five Boy. bars and you see a Cessna. Yeah, I have a 
I have a great connection to the spy tool. But as you pointed out, they there. couldn't do a handoff because they're, they're not really in communication with the cell network. So you're gonna uh, it, your it, call's gonna be interrupted at some point. Yeah, I, it, it, you know, we the problem is very little is known about this. Um, the government clams up, and and you know, the the only problem I have is the secrecy. If if this weren't secret, then then no. er, then if, like okay, justify your existence. No, no, it's I not. Mean, it's, it's it's a fishing expedition. They say right. they say just as the NSA does. No, no, if you're not a, a suspect, we let quote let go of the information. But you've got to imagine they're harvesting it and storing it in that giant facility in Utah, just as the NSA yep. does. They collect everything. They say, look, we're we're not going to look at it if you're not a suspect. But if you ever became a suspect, you could be right. pretty sure they we would, would say, like to, well, we know where he was. Yeah, we would like to know where these people were. Um, uh, CNN contacted the Department of Justice for comment, and an official at the DOJ would not confirm or deny the use of flying spoof cell towers. He said any discussion would let criminals and foreign governments, quote, Determine our capabilities and limitations, which, you know, is just like, well, you can't make us talk, so we're not going to. And, of course, because this is metadata, it's not you don't need a warrant. Right. Uh, and this is where really we've got to get the courts up to date because metadata is valuable. It does have is identifiable ultimately and has a huge uh, privacy implication. It's not just, you know, oh, metadata. And so this is like a pen register search. This is like when they go to the portals run by the phone companies and say, hey, where was Leo on uh, Friday? You, I mean, we've discussed this, of course, in the context of Snowden and, and all of that. But uh, you could easily make the case that metadata is a far richer source of, of information for, for research and plumbing, even than knowing what the person's, you know, yammering about, about their dry cleaning and, and you know, and whether they need to remember to get cat food or, or what. I mean, you know, who you talk to and when, that, you know, your, your six degrees of separation, that's, that's really vital information. Well, and we know it is because they want it because it helps them track terrorists. So we know it's valuable. And, you know, and we know that people knock on, you know, that, that the government knocks on people's doors saying, hey, you're a friend of so-and-so. Tell us about him. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just what you're going to get. Isn't that nice? Yeah.